Good morning, friends. Uh, I'm really excited to have a good friend and somebody I've been collaborating with over the years, Dr. Peter Mackay with me today. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi. Nice to be here, Punasha. Beautiful day. It is. So the conversation today is going to uh, focus on a lot of different topics, but the most important thing today is how to be resilient in the body. And we're going to take a look at biomechanics, uh, human performance, the connection between the mind-body, and a lot of different areas. But before I really get into the conversation, I want to just do a quick intro of, of Peter because this is really important. So uh, firstly, Dr. Peter Mackay is a board-certified chiropractor in the state of California and a qualified medical evaluator. Dr. Peter Mackay has an extensive career in sports injuries, industrial medicine, and physical rehabilitation. Dr. Mackay was a founding member of the Titleist Performance Institute Advisory Board. In recognition of his accomplishment as a pioneer in golf fitness, he was an inaugural inductee into the TPI Hall of Fame at the recent World Golf Fitness Summit in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, and basically, over Peter Mackay over the years has trained hundreds of professional athletes in PGA, LPGA, NHL, NFL, MLB, and is kind of the authority when it comes to uh, biomechanics and just overall performance. Personally, he has been, you know, we've been collaborating. He's kept me and my family healthy over the years, and for that, I'm really grateful. So it, without any further, I would say, delay, let's kind of really uh, unpack this conversation, and the topic is... I want to kind of use a quote which he kind of uses in his book which is coming up soon it's not how far you hit it or how long you hit it far so with that dr mckay how how can what is your principle when it comes into resilience building longevity in the human performance and the human body well one of the obvious things that i see every day in my office and i see with athletes coming in is that there's there's usually a need and a desire to either get better, to get well, or to get over an injury. And most people come in with no real um, idea of what I call their default pattern. That is, how does their body set up in space? How does it, what are the habits that you've developed? What are the motor preferences? How do you move? And, and these are all, you know, tending to be, uh, become hab habitual to most people. And that's the first step is to try to figure out, well, what exactly is going on? What are your weaknesses and strengths with respect to how you move and, and how you set up in space? So we call that the default pattern. Identify that and you move from there. So when you look at the default pattern, I think, and this is important because everything has a baseline. That's genetics. So people are predisposed to certain things. So even so, so is the body. So there's a default pattern, how everybody operates from. So from your perspective today, is there a quick assessment which people can do today with everything going online uh, and the virtual world? Are there things you can do today with somebody with, on a Zoom call with you? Can you analyze them and just say, this is kind of the tendency to the best, obviously being face-to-face -face is the best. But when you look at somebody, you know, can you kind of do a quick analysis? Yeah, actually, I, I just had a golfer the other day I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And, and within about three or four minutes on the Zoom, I had him doing some basic screens, like uh, being able to touch his toes and turn and bend and typical orthopedic type maneuvers. Uh, Titleist Performance Institute over the years has established a very extensive catalog of what they call screens. And what you're really looking for is what the patient or the the player can do and what he can't do. And to the extent that those physical limitations can be modified, um, that's, that's what the goal is, you know? So today when you talk about, especially in today, uh, we talk about posture and alignment being the foundation, right? We talk food as medicines and that way posture is as I would say, connects us to the ground and up, right? It starts from your toes all the way up and alignment is so important. So from a chiropractor perspective, today when you look at what is happening, you know, I find I'm pretty much spending most of my day on Zoom right? From morning till evening. So I think more than ever before, people are now confined to this video call. So that's happening. On the other hand, first responders, people on the front line are probably working more than ever before. So they're getting taxed. And that there's a third segment, which are the seniors who are kind of now becoming very sedentary because they can't even leave the house. So when you look at these different segments, are there things, are there basic exercise sequences or things you can kind of recommend people can do? Well, actually, as you mentioned that on 
first responders, uh, there are things that, that our typical police officers have to put up with. For example, having a gun belt that's overweighted on one side. That sets up for an imbalance. Last year, we had the, uh, the uh, fire chief in from Phoenix at our WOW seminar, and we talked about the predisposition to cancer and some of these uh, firefighters that are exposed to, um, in the case of carrying their hosing underneath one arm, there was, an, there was a predisposition to lymphoma happening on the same side. So most professionals will have to do repetitive um, actions over and over again. They will be exposed to certain toxic materials and elements as the firefighters are. So having a sense of, of exactly that, what their environmental exposure is, gives us a leg up in trying to figure out, okay, now what can we do to kind of reverse the effect or limit the exposure and help them really work through all, all the stress that goes along with sitting, driving, wearing belts, pulling hoses, et cetera, right? So uh, identifying the environmental stress is a big deal. The ergonomics, for example, in, in seated postures, we know sitting is the new smoking, mm -hmm. but those, those are key variables that we, we have to take into consideration. So when you look at uh, this whole, the world ahead of us right now, uh, I guess with uh, COVID-19 and, 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 the, and the decade going forward, are there things you are thinking that, you know, from your own practice and uh, talking with your clients from athletes to, you know, the, you have the entire spectrum, are there things you're recommending they should be doing from a movement perspective or exercise? Because you actually have combined sports physiology with neuroscience. So how is all this coming to you? How you can, how, what is your thoughts on keeping your clients fitter? Well, uh, Science Journal actually just came out with an interesting article on how exercise affects cancer. Mm -hmm. And what has been shown is that in, in analyzing some of the biomarkers, when you do moderate levels of exercise, you're getting an increase in things like interleukin-6 and um, epinephrine and norepinephrine that tend to act as biosignals to shut down tumor and uh, tumor growth and tumor metastasis. So we're, we're starting to see that, you know, for years, the, the, the generation of joggers and the whole movement towards exercise was, was pushed a lot by the ability to lose weight and stay in shape physically. But what we're seeing now is exercise is way more than that. As a matter of fact, as a tool to lose weight, exercise is not your number one thing. Nutrition is right but if you think about exercise from the standpoint of it helps you uh, monitor and utilize your energy systems including your endocrine system your immune system all your biological systems rely on energy and what exercise does is it modifies and modulates your ability to use energy efficiently and that's the whole balance between living and dying every day <laughs> So if you look at the Makai method, you know, from your life perspective, and you look at your demo, what are some of the things you do to keep yourself fit? Because you are still super athletic, you still play sports, and you really are, you know, I would say, a, a poster child for somebody who really is very, very active. And I love some of the things you do, because you've integrated things like aromatherapy. I was talking to Dr. Valencia Porto this morning, and she was talking about how aromatherapy is so powerful to really kind of help in healing. So... And she even recommended things like, you know, lavender for sleep and, you know, a focus using let, peppermint. Let me touch on that from an athletic perspective. I mean, you've seen me use it yourself. Right. Um, the condition response is so powerful. If your learning experience has any connection with emotion, for example, it's been shown to be a more, more successful learning experience, whether you're talking about a skill or cognition, memory. And so what we do with our golfers, we can connect the aroma of say an oil, which is a blend like something called stress away. And we can connect that to a relaxation state that we can entrain by having a headset on, which helps the, helps the player or the patient get into that um, alpha or theta state, whatever we're going for. And from there, um, they take that same connection to the oil, they put it in their bag, and when they're coming to the, the 15th grain and they got a five foot putt, they can pull out the oil and guess what? That connection brings them back to that relaxation state. So that's how we use conditioned responses with the olfactory system. But when we talk about in, in my, I, I, don't, I don't like to think of 
of um, every everybody seems to have tools in their toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. And coaches have variable ways and various ways to try to get the message across to their students. And it's a very complex time. There's complex being complex systems theories, complex adaptive systems theories, all these different um, principles and theories with respect to how we learn and how we make athletes better. But the practicality of it is that it comes down to a one-on-one -on -one situation mm -hmm. where somehow you have to be listening to them, asking them questions and letting them discover their own answers versus you, you know, having your noises going off in your head. You know, you become an intent listener, so to speak, versus, you know, the, the little message in your head's going off instead mm -hmm. of listening to what they have to say. Right. So I like to think that our program, my, my people that I work with and my team, we're developing uh, an approach which allows us to try to find out what people want and guide them without too much queuing, right? So it's, it's an interesting time in the world of, of coaching. We're all coaches to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have a routine which you follow for yourself, for your own physical fitness? Are there things which you say, this is what I do, the five things you do to keep yourself fit? Is there like a, I have, a recipe? I have to admit at this point in time, I'm looking out in a nice ocean view here and missing my, my gym. Yeah. I'm one of those people. I, I, I do much better in a, in a formal environment like, like a gymnasium. Yeah. I have more trouble working out at home. But here's the deal. And I have to do this every day with my patients right. and, and psychologists, psychiatrists will tell you when you're, you're trying to get an addict, for example, to get away from a particular behavioral pattern, mm -hmm. you can't rely on willpower. Somehow you have to get them to engage in, in lifestyle changes in attitude changes. Right? So what I try to do is get, it's, it's like a two minute rule. Mm -hmm. Just give me two minutes of doing, uh, say, a corrective exercise for your posture that could help you with text neck or lower back issue. Just give me two minutes a day, Mrs. Smith, and let's see what happens. Because if their expectations are so grandiose and so they're so excited about getting on a fitness program, that doesn't last. Right. But if you can get them to just get a toe in the water, spend a couple of minutes a day doing a very specific move, then all of a sudden that will tend to blossom over a few weeks and they start to realize that it doesn't have to be the agony of it and the ecstasy of, of boot camp. It, right. it, it becomes more of an enjoyable process that they want to move towards, right? Literally right. move towards, yeah. You know, this is interesting because uh, Dr. B.J. Fogg from Stanford's Behavior Change Lab, he talks about tiny habits. He says right. people typically come and say, I want to run a marathon. I want to run 10 miles. And he says, start, make it really, really small. Like just two steps he has, right? He says, make it small. Example, I want to do two, uh, I would say, uh, sit-ups, right? And he says, put it after something you do every day. Every time I go to the bathroom, I want to do two sit-ups. And eventually what happens, you go to the bathroom four, day, four times a day to the urinal. You can actually do two sit-ups. You've done 10. Eventually it's creating these tiny habits, which become, and he has a very nice formula. It's called B, behavior is equal to motivation, ability, and trigger. You've got to trigger the behavior. But you need to understand the person's motivation and ability. And this is really important because putting, making tiny habits, I think is key. But you also touched on something previously, which is about the condition response and got me thinking. And there's this saying which says neurons which fire together, wire together, which is Hebb's law. You just need to have that association, which are these kind of, these are kind of, I would say biohacks, right? So when right. you look at your own, when you look at a practice, which is in San Diego, and I, I'll put a link up so people can obviously now consult with you online. Um, what are some of the things you've looked at from a technology? Because I know you've been kind of pushing technology, everything from brain entrainment to even evaluating things like PEMF and things like that. We found uh, interesting tools which people have used in their aid towards recovery. Yes, I'm, I'm very much in tune with technologies that are um, a means of assessing, like for balance and for coordination, but also for what we're calling uh, a lot of this movement came out of Europe called brain endurance training. Mm -hmm. And also out of Canada, there's a, there's a program I use called NeuroTracker. 
And from Stanford, we have the, uh, the brain halo that we're using. So we're using technology as a means to try to make the whole concept of assessing our abilities to learn, uh, diagnosing where the weaknesses are. You know, I get a lot of seniors coming in that have balance issues and you can head these things off the pass. We've got a whole balance protocol that I use. Very difficult to teach seniors mm -hmm. to train for balance because it's a precarious situation. If you if you put them in a on a slippery slope, so to speak, you got to be you're at risk of falling. So it takes a little creativity to try to get um, seniors in into a, a training mode where they can actually get the benefits and and feel the um, some of the patterns that they're going to need. For example, if they do slip on the carpet, if it's if it's totally something that they haven't been used to, when one foot goes in front of the other, all of a sudden their brain's not going to engage appropriately. Mm -hmm. So we've got some pretty creative ways of trying to teach seniors how to stabilize and how to you know preempt that that falling, which is critical. In fact, I'm going to attach the video which you sent me with Milan, and I'm going to actually add that to the end of this video so people can actually uh, stay tuned for some of the very simple things Dr. Makai has kind of suggested that we, people can follow. I'll actually add it to the video. You're right, Punash. It is if you don't keep it simple, people are not going to engage in it long enough to get the benefits. We know it's different. When I deal with a professional athlete, they will play until their hands bleed to get something right. You know, we call it dirty practice. And I use that analogy with patients all the time. I said, I don't expect you to be a pro, but I want you to do what you have to do to make a difference. You need to make the change. If you just move so far, you're not going to get the benefit. But if you just take it that little bit extra, it's going to help repattern and re-educate your nervous system system so that you own it right now i was uh, switching gears i wanted to kind of i just finished reading this book uh, the golden rules by bob bowman who was michael phelps coach uh -huh. and and it was fascinating because he talks about how in the, i think the beijing olympics on the with kavich he won by a by hairs with 0.01 right and what looked like you know it, but it, took, it was 10 years of training right because the only two things they practiced was how to go fast between by the time he gets off the board till he hits the other side, how fast can he swim, and how, how hard he hits the board. That's the only two things they practice. And what really worked for him on that day was how hard he hit the board, right? Which gave him that edge. So you look at today, and, and I, I was reading the book, and it was fascinating because he never missed a day of practice. He swam even through Christmas. Maybe he's an exception. But today when you look at this whole period of this lockdown, and I'm just wondering, what does the future of sports look like to you? professional sports, when you look at all these, uh, what is your thought process when you look at, you know, uh, big sporting events, are they stadiums and, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts, you know, any thoughts? A good athlete can help, uh, can self-organize. They can create a complex movement pattern just by watching your outcome and doing it on their own. That's why you hear about so many of these guys never had a lesson, but yet they make it to the PGA Tour. Somewhere along the line though, if, if that movement pattern is not totally the most efficient or optimum as far as injury prevention or longevity, you can see where that might run into problems. But it's a very difficult thing to inter intervene with a high level athlete in any sport unless you really know what you're doing. So the, the approach to, for, most, mo for most coaches is less is better. Hmm. And you definitely don't want to be, we know from um, motor control theories uh, Dr. Smith and others and Gabrielle Wolf have, pro have proven that, that you don't want to be giving constant feedback. You don't want to be giving cueing. You want people to um, make their mistakes because when you have that variability, when you learn, your learning process transfers and it lasts longer and it's more in detail. So it's, it's a tough thing when you're dealing with um, and, and if we switch sides now, we talk about the average person coming in and wants to understand how to improve their posture. Again, I think less is better. Getting them to do two to three to four minutes at a time of very specific um, movements goes a lot further than trying to get them into a boot camp attitude of, you know, you're going to train for three months and you're going to be in the best shape of your life. Mm. That, that rarely works, right? Okay. So uh, one of the things I want to ask you about is visualization. Today, no, my, obviously my son can't play golf, but there's this theory that when you visualize a round of golf, and you actually play the same round. You're, you're the, motor, the, the brain, the way it processes, almost very similar. 
it's like. So if you, there were a lot of golfers who were injured who visualized playing, they actually played less golf, but they actually visualized the, the sequence of hitting or playing a perfect round. What are your thoughts on today when you look at, you know, uh, this well, there is a lot of cert, uh, research on perceptual learning and mirror learning and, and um, visualization. The classic uh, situation was the Vietnam War vet who was uh, in, in, in um, two years of internment and he practiced his home course in Texas every day. When he came back the first round, he played that home course. It was the best round he ever had, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the most important thing when it comes to what strategies you're going to use, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of a brain myth that we're visual learners or auditory learners. That, that idea still holds true for a lot of people. Some people are going to, are going to learn faster because that's what they're used to. I believe to get transfer and to get longevity, what you need to do is trick them to work on their weaknesses. I just did a, uh, a lecture to the San Diego Superior Court judges on brain training and how to survive the bench in December. Mm -hmm. And one of the tricks I gave them is that if you're not an auditory learner, mm -hmm. then try listening to Audible. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a contradiction, right? You're listening to Audible on the way to work and you don't really retain a lot because that's not the way you like to learn. Well, guess what? After doing that for a while, if you test yourself, and that's the critical thing, the only the, the best way to learn is to literally close the book once you finish studying and then test yourself, ask yourself the questions. You can't fool yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So if you use the Audible every day for a couple of weeks, you'd be very surprised. All of a sudden, you're answering questions at the end and you find out you are learning, right? Mm -hmm. So you nurture what your weaknesses are. And I think that that goes a long way to creating the variability in our circuitry in our brain and enhancing longevity and staving off uh, degenerative changes also. So, I want to kind of, I mean, coming into, you know, the, the, I guess towards the end of this conversation, I want to kind of maybe touch on a couple of things. What is your advice you're giving to your professional athletes today who cannot go out and train, who are kind of now at home or, and they need to be practicing, but they're obviously at home. Are there things that you are giving them as tips or are there things they're doing, which you find, you know, that you're prescribing? Well, when you get to be an elite athlete, the physical yeah. is usually pretty close across the board. The difference is going to be, as Jack Nicholas would say, that six inches between your ears. That's the, that's the space that makes the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. And we have different ways of looking at it. Traditionally, we thought about focus and being in the zone, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, with more, more um, uh, defined neuroscience, we're starting to see that the, the mind-body connection, the way we nurture circuitry, the way we learn and rehearse when we're in our REM sleep, all these things are very, very important when it comes to how you retain your skills, how you transfer the abilities, and how you perform under stress. And that's where, like friends of ours, like Tom House, working with some of the elite quarterbacks, these guys learn a strategy. They learn how to play when the lights go on, and they're un. Uh, affected by the stress. And so I, what I've been doing to answer your question is, is I've been telling my players, take this time and get yourself to move up the ladder with that mental fortitude, that ability to not just focus, but to train your endurance in your brain. You know, when you, when you lift muscle uh, weights in your workout, you're tearing down the muscle while you're doing it, right? When does it build up? It builds up when you're sleeping. And it's the same with your brain. When you're working your brain appropriately, it's during your REM sleep that you're rehearsing and you're, you're breaking down inflammatory processes, for example. And in this day and age, by the way, your immune system is, is being turned on. So we didn't talk too much about it today, but sleep is one of the most, most important things to do with learning and healing and longevity. And uh, we've been programmed, by the way, to have less sleep. If we think about our primate neighbors, our great apes, they hang around and they sleep for 12, 14 hours a day. Right. So, I mean, we, this isn't, we talked about sleep. We should talk about sleep because this is an interesting con topic. I just was uh, thinking about it. You know, when we were actually hunter gatherers, we all hunter and gathered in packs and we were always together. And it realized that when we actually separated from the pack, basically that our sleep was actually impacted because there's something called micro arousal because you had to kind of stay awake to make sure you're not being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. 
So when you actually slept together, so there's, there's research now which proves that if you're, if you're together, if you're in a, in a group or in a community, which in this, and you're not alone, you sleep better, right? So, then, right? so there's a lot of, I would say, research which goes to show that we are designed to be social pack animals, behavior is kind of social. And I'm, I'm also looking to see what is some of the impact uh, with the social distancing and the little bit of isolation which is happening right now. And, what and is the downstream interest? Right. Yeah. And of course, to be, the, the classic example, Scientific American did a journal a couple of years ago where they talked about the great apes mm -hmm. and humans being the only mammals that need to ingest vitamin C. Most mammals can produce their own. And it all comes down to the laws of thermodynamics and energy. If you don't need a process, your brain's going to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. So we were getting so much fruit and the great apes were getting so much fruit. They 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 genetically lost the ability to produce vitamin C, right? Now, great apes and don't have a lot of diabetes and don't have a lot of cardiovascular disease. And so if you think about it, as we became hunters and gatherers, we started to move and walk a lot. And I think there was a, an epigenetic pressure within humans that, hey, we're already cleaning out our arteries. All this activity and walking is keeping our cardiovascular system fluid and cleaned out. So we lost the ability that great apes still have. They don't have plaquing in their arteries. They don't have diabetes. So we've lost that, that genetic ability. It was, it was epigenetically suppressed because we walk so much. Now what's happened in the last 120 years? We're not. So right. it's starting to show up as cardiovascular disease. Now, of course, diet has a lot to do with it also, but there are, this is, this, this is a classic example of epigenetics at work in a short period of time. Right. So. And in fact, today is International Earth Day. And I think some of the things we should talk about is about our dependence to nature, right? And we all know that we, when we walk bare feet on the, on the beach or you know, connected with nature, there is this kind of grounding which happens, which reduces chronic low-grade inflammation, uh, which kind of takes away all this oxidative stress, right, with the EMFs and things like that. So I think walking bare feet is now scientifically proven. But also one of the things which the ancient wisdom traditions had, the concept of circadian rhythm, right? You, you woke up with the sun, you set with the sun. And today with all our, uh, and also some of the things which you're doing today, which is really harmful, you're constantly staring at a blue screen. Right, so it's actually right. Im impacting our melatonin production, which is our sleep cycle. And so we have to now kind of look at health and well-being in a complete, comprehensive approach, and not distinguishing between the Western and the Eastern. So kind of taking an integrative approach, which you have done in your what in your practice, which I love, is that I can come in and I and I go through the the, the protocol and diagnosis with the with the, with the science and with the with the with on the mat, and then. It, based on who, what I need, you also say, Napunach, maybe you want to try acupressure or acupuncture, right? And that's, how has that worked in your practice or using some of these ancient, ancient techniques? Well, it, it comes down to where we've gone in our, our medical world in the Western side is, is very Newtonian, very reductionist, analytic reduction. You take things apart, you try to reassemble them and figure them out. Well, just think about it. Uh, most of what I talk today about is Newtonian mechanics, but you're now delving into the world that I really love, which is quantum mechanics. And it's what we don't know and we don't understand, which is going to answer all the questions that we have out there. You know, Schrodinger in 1994 wrote a book on what is life, and he was alluding to through his quantum theories. Um, I think that we need to start, and what, what Eastern medicine has brought us is closer to that world of energy and energy healing. So right. I think that's where things are going, and we need to be open to the fact that... Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I look forward to really uh, sharing, first of all, the video which you, which you shared with me, which people can put to a simple practice, which people can do at home. But also, let's maybe uh, have a, a, a further discussion on some of the multiple topics you talk about, right? One is this whole thing about cognitive exercises, neural exercises, which can really repattern and, and improve our overall well-being. And, and we're, what we're going to do is go through some basic exercises that, that follow a fundamental principle. If you're trying to hit a golf ball, you're not going to hit that golf ball with your hands. You're going to transfer your weight, move your upper body, your arms, and your hands in what we call a kinematic sequence. And what we try to do here is to uh, remove the stress in the neck. Most people, especially in this day and age with the text neck syndrome, are doing a lot of 
this stuff. Their necks are bending back and forth. And if you look at most people over 40, they've got a lot of arthritis and wear and tear right at that junction between the lower neck and the upper back. So what can we do to change that? If, if you are programmed to bend your head like that, it's going to wear out. But if you get programmed to use your upper back and your shoulders and your head in sequence, it's going to change the stress points. So let me show you what happens here. Millen, if you could take your hands out in front and just interlace your fingers. What you're going to do is you're going to try to pull your shoulder blades together. That's it. You're going to start to lift your arms. And once your arms get up to a level of your ears now, what you're going to do is let your head start to roll backwards. So you see here, what we've done is we've created a sequence. That's about it. Now the upper back and arms come forward and then the head, chin comes down on the chest. So you see what we've done here now is we've reprogrammed. Instead of his head bending back and forward like this, he's now engaged the whole upper back, the, the shoulder joints, and the arms. The head moves last. So the head moves last going back. The head moves last going forward. And what that does is it preserves these joints. Now, dosage. We talked about dosage in our, in our talk previously. How often would you do this? Um, I try to get patients to do this about 10 times maybe twice a day, but here's the caveat. If you have a swollen finger, all right, your finger can bend way back here, right? That's almost 90 degrees, no problem. If I push it further, it starts to hurt. And that's what we call myofascial pain. And that's what most of us get, the aches and pains we get is because of this stress strain on the joints. So if you've injured your knuckle, say that was swollen, you're only gonna be able to move it maybe 30 degrees today before you hit that pain barrier. Pain is not something you want to push into. Regardless of what people say about pain, no pain, no gain, that doesn't, that doesn't pertain to injured body parts. When you're trying to recover from an injury or you have an arthritic joint, the last thing you want to do is set off and trigger all those pain signals. That creates a stress response, which does anything but heal you, okay? So that what I'm getting at here is in some days you might find, especially with seniors, that your head gets to about there and it's starting to get a little stiff or sore. Well, don't let the momentum of your arms take you to a place where you're not comfortable, all right? But each day you'll challenge it. And that's the, that's the most important thing. Create a little bit of a challenge that's safe and doesn't really irritate things. And you will notice, most people will notice, patients of mine will notice within two or three weeks before you know it, instead of having maybe 10 degrees of extension, they now have a full flowing pattern there. Now what's another example of this same situation? Let's imagine you're driving your car in traffic and you're all tense. Go ahead, get in that position. And see how your head gets forward and you're here like this. And especially for people over 40 or 50, they start to lose their blind spot. They have trouble turning to be able to see in that blind spot, okay? Now, look what happens here. If I have you pull your shoulders back, and turn your chest, your head will flow that way. So again, we've got this magic of the kinematic sequence being the real um, effective way to try to take the stress off an area. The same person who's here and tries to turn without unloading that is gonna run into the resistance. That's why we, we have that inability to check our blind spot. Let's go to another really important exercise, especially as we were talking about seniors earlier and balance. This exercise is called a sit-stand. And I'm gonna teach you, first of all, and you know how to do this from our golf, golf drills. If you take your toes and flare them up, you are going to have a platform that consists of the knuckle of your little toe, your big toe, and your heel that forms a triangle. We call it the tripod. And when you stand on that tripod, it creates a very stable base from which you can work. In golf, as you know, you work between your tripods, don't you? You work in that platform. That's what keeps you very stable. So in this exercise, we're gonna take advantage of that short foot, we call it. You're going to come up and let's just do it. First of all, you're gonna create a little pressure on the knees in with your hands, a little pressure with your knees out. And we've got a block, in this case, we've got a roller between his feet and it's about shoulder width. So just come up into a standing posture. There we go. Now he makes that look easy, but trust me, there's a lot of people that cannot stand up out of a chair. Go ahead, sit back down again. And the sit part of it needs to be very controlled. This exercise is amazing. You're working on balance, posture, alignment. You're connecting your foundation platform, which is your feet, to your core platform, which is your pelvis. You're taking any twist or torque out of that 
alignment, structure. Um, you're working on strength. You're working on, if you do enough of them, you're working on endurance. So there's so many factors of physical fitness and parameters of fitness you're working on in this one exercise. So let's talk about the, the last part of this. This is, this is a little bit more complicated and you should do this with supervision. So now you're gonna come up and we're gonna do what we call GYOB, which is grab your own butt. You squeeze your glutes and you feel those glutes activated. You know how to do this all as you come up. So as you feel those glutes activated, you allow your pelvis to thrust forward. Now, what does this look like? We talked, Punasha, on our, our podcast today about a slip and fall. When most people slip, not a trip, but a slip, they'll have one leg shoot out and they'll fall backwards, right? So this is a great way to get your body um, used to and accommodating a pattern which it might have to um, overcome at some point in time. So let's do that uh, stand up the way we taught you. There you go. Now GYOB. Now here's the sequence. The sequence is the pelvis moves forward, the shoulders are back, and then the head rolls back. Now this young man is very athletic and very flexible. Okay. Now you come back and slowly sit down again. So the negative going down is under control. You don't drop down. And this is another thing. For seniors, you may have to create more lift. You can put two or three pillows on top of a basic chair. You can get these chairs at Costco, just a stacking chair that make it very easy to do these exercises. Um, so you might have to put a couple of pillows in there because you don't want to try to challenge yourself too much. So that's why it's, it's, it's very important to do this with some supervision to begin with, especially if you've been challenged, if you've had any medical issues, you've, you've got an arthritic hip or knee, you've had a stroke. So, uh, use caution, have your medical practitioner help your chiropractor, physical therapist. But this is one of the great tools we use in our office to enhance, help prevent falls, and help prepare people for stability. Let's show it one more time, okay? You're going to come up and show me the complete sequence. You're going to come up, pressing in with the hands, GYOB, pelvis forward, shoulders back, and head back. And then you reverse the pattern, and as you go down, you control that. You don't drop, you control it. That's, it. that's what we call a negative and that teaches, that really enhances your stability when you learn how to go down slowly versus letting momentum drop you. Thank you.